Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome to Father's Arms Fellowship. Yes. Uh, feasting on the Word. Listen, we've got the manna from heaven tonight. Hallelujah. In the spiritual and in the natural. We just got it. I'm telling you, it's, it's going on. And we're going to sing uh, some old songs tonight. I, my mind took me back to the 70s tonight. And so uh, we're just going to do some old songs. And uh, kind of prepare the way of, uh, for Greg. I'm my beloved Tanny. This man wrote for me his love to I'm my beloved and he did the most. This man wrote for me his love. I'm my beloved and he is mine. This man wrote for me his love. This man wrote for me his love. There's one way to peace through the power of the cross. This man wrote for me his love. Through the power of the cross and his hand over me is love. There's only one way to peace through the power of the cross and his man over me is love. His man over me is love. He keeps me at his banqueting table. His man over me is love. He keeps me at his banqueting table. Love. He beats me at his banqueting table. His manner over me is love. His manner over me is love. His banner over me is love. My loving kindness.
You get sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Oh, what a love between my Lord and I. I keep falling in love with Him over and over and over and over again. Come, bless the Lord.
wants to hang low. When our head wants to hang low. You're the lifter of our heads. Yeah. We thank you for it, Lord. You even told us, Lord, lift up each other's hands. Lift up the hands that hang down and strengthen the feeble knees. Dear God, let us all be strengthened with head up, looking, Lord, look, lift up your eyes for your redemption draw up nigh. In Jesus' name, Lord, we look up to you and praise you for the victory which is ahead for each and every one of us. You've already made, you've already given us the victory and we just walked in it tonight. In Jesus' name. Thank you for your word. Lord bless our teacher tonight, the Holy Spirit. Let him flow through our teacher, uh, Pastor Greg, tonight as he brings the word. Open our hearts, our minds, our souls. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Lesson six. There we go. All right. They have there. Oh, there we go. All right. Well, it's good to be back. Brother Dan did an awesome job the last couple of weeks. And, uh, and poor guy. I mean, I do have a little experience doing this, but poor guy thought I was going to rid him. He says, I thought you were going to give it to me because I was nervous. I'm like, I would have never known it until you said anything. And I said, well, then, you know. But he did an awesome job. And so... Glad to have everyone here tonight, for those of you that are here on Facebook, and uh, we're in the book of Exodus, and even in the Old Testament, Jesus can be found on every page, even in those uh, genealogies and the numbers of the tribes and all that, he can still be found in it if you dig deeper or dig deep enough. And so we're going to we're going to take a little take a little journey in how God increases our faith. And we're in Exodus 15 and, and chapter 16 tonight. And sometimes uh, on our journey into intimacy, uh, we get put into situations that at the time were not so necessarily yee-haw, yippee-yay-yay, uh, oh, everything's wonderful, and all that. But sometimes it's the Lord allows us to go through these things to increase our faith. And faith is what the Lord is looking for in us. And faith really... <coughs> determines what the degree of our intimacy is with him. And I can say that because I can just I can look right at Hebrews eleven verse six where it says, But without faith it is possible to please him. Who are we talking about? God, yeah. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Did you notice the key diligently? And that is something uh, that as believers we must do. Um, in the good times and the bad times. And uh, this is based on the scripture alone. Without faith it's not hard to please God. It's impossible. And if we want to have an intimate relationship with Him, then we please Him by having faith. And uh, even the disciples said to Jesus, increase our faith. Uh, I believe it was the Roman centurion who was struggling, but asked Jesus, help me to have more faith. And so, uh, so how does he, how does, uh, how does God increase our faith? Well, sometimes he allows us to go through certain things that require faith. Uh, the one thing I've always said, and I know many of you have heard me say this before, that so I think we make 
Christianity eat too easy. And people will walk, you know, we'll either we'll have a, uh, a stirring message or which are which are good. And some of us that, you know, part of our witnessing team and all that, you know, they, they share uh, the good news. And then we make it sound like it's all easy peasy when it's over. Bottom line is, no, it's just the beginning. And since the enemy can't have you anymore, he's going to do what he can to attack you. And this is something that we don't tell people and we need to. Because a lot of times what happens is it's everything is fine and dandy until the first crisis comes on. And then... You know, I don't want to. I don't want to say. Well, it's like weeding at weeding things out. But um, sometimes we have to understand that it's not all easy being a Christian, and we're going to see a similar situation to this in uh, in our study tonight. And in chapter 15 and 16 of Exodus, we're going to find at least two ways that God increases our faith. All right? The first one is, is through disappointments. What? Well, let's face it. We all have disappointments in life. Whether things, whether in things or events, school, a new job, a business venture, people, for whatever reason, uh, God uses our disappointments to increase our faith. Amen. Great success and victories are often followed by bitter disappointments. Mm. If I were to ask you for a show of hands, how many, I'm not going to make you do this, but I would, my question would be, how many, uh, the minute we have a mountaintop uh mountaintop experience does immediately the attack come and disappointment comes nearly right after that. Oh, yeah. I would say most of us. Um, but whatever, it's, it's when we're at the mountaintop that we really need to watch um, watch our pride for one thing. But no, just be careful because we should always be aware that something could Something might just very well come down the road. Now, if you'll recall our last study, the Israelites crossed the Red Sea. And there they were, they were between a rock and a hard place. And God uh, basically opened the sea three miles wide so all two to four million could go through there. And then he basically drowned the, the Egyptian army. That's a high moment. Would y'all agree? Well, uh, in the first 18 verses of Exodus in chapter 15, they, they are singing, singing strong. I mean, let's face it. What would you do if you were one of the Israelites and you just watch God do this cool, awesome thing. I think I'd be I'd be jumping for joy just a little bit also. But then but then their music turns into mourning. So basically they go to the desert of Shur right after this experience and um they travel for three days without finding water. Now, they're in the desert. It's hot. It's dusty. Um, there's two to four million of them along with their livestock, their wagons, and all whatever material possessions that they had plundered from Egypt plus their own. And I guarantee you, it is making a cloud of dust. And so they're searching... They're searching for water. And 
And it's amazing to me, although I'm not going to uh, stick it to them too much because I'm just as guilty as they are. They just been through this mountaintop experience and then all of a sudden three days later they start whining like babies. And so you can look at Exodus 15 where it says, Now they came to Merah, they could not drink the waters of Merah for they were bitter. Therefore it was called Mount Marah. And the people complained against Moses saying, What shall we, what shall we drink? Well, Put yourself in Moses' spot. You know, we, you know, even though Moses uh, was a great and powerful leader, and even though he had great and mighty faith, and it just seems like he knows what he's doing and everything's fine, he's experiencing a lot of the same things these Israelites are, are, are experiencing. He doesn't know how, how to get the water. He doesn't, you know... They're hitting him up. They're complaining like crazy. You know, imagine, imagine two million people. Are we there yet? I mean, think about it. But Moses wisely, wisely gives his, he shows his faith by giving the problem to the Lord. And the Lord shows him uh, a piece of wood which he throws into the water and makes it sweet. Let me uh, let me let me just uh, read this here. The next few verses. Then Moses led on Israel onward from the Sea of Reeds, and they went out to the wilderness of Shur. But they traveled three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters because they were bitter. On the on the account of this, this was called Marah. Uh, if you'll recall, if you look at the book of uh, Ruth, you'll see uh, Naomi. When she goes back to Israel, she says, "Call me Mara, call me bitter." So this, so this is a, and this is a, uh, it's an important place and an important word. So the people complained to Moses, "What are we going to drink?" So he cried out to Adonai, and Adonai showed him a tree. When he threw it in the waters, they were made sweet. He made a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them. And he said, "This is verse twenty-six. If you diligently listen to the voice of Adonai your God." And do what is right in his eyes, pay attention to his mitzvot, um, and keep all his decrees. I will put none of the diseases on you, which I put on the Egyptians, for I am Adonai, who heals you. All right? A couple significant things. How long had it been? since they left the Red Sea. Remember I just told you. How many days had they been traveling? Three days. Okay. They've, the Lord tells Moses to throw a tree and makes to make the water into, into the water source. And it made it sweet, did it not? Okay. What did our Savior die on? Tree. What happens when he rose? There's three days. There's three days. But did things become sweet? Hallelujah. Because death became life. Death became life. Little pun the Holy Spirit put in there, I believe. And so, so think about it. God used Jesus' example, which the Israelites had no idea who he was, as an example. The scripture says, These things have been written that we may know and may learn from these. Paul tells us this. So, what we're reading here is being used for our learning. Hallelujah, right? And so, when you have a bitter experience, to whom do you cry out? We should be crying out to the Lord, right? That should be the first thing. However, many of us don't. 
me included. I'm learning, though, to cry out to the Lord first. All right? And, and if there's bitterness in our lives right now, God does give us a promise. Look at this. Call to me, and I will answer you, and show you great and mighty things, things which you do not know. So the Lord is he's testing the Israelites. And sometimes God will use our bitter disappointments in life to test us and increase our faith. Our Mara or Mara experience can be anything that is a bitter disappointment to us. Whatever it is, we can be tested and, and we can use this to grow our faith. Well, what do you mean? All right. Let me give you just a general example. You know, we were really struggling for money. I mean, we were just, you know, we were broke. And we trusted the Lord. We gave our tithes of what we had. And he provided. General example. Our faith was tested. We trusted the Lord anyway. He came through. General example. All right. When I went through my prostate cancer ordeal, I really didn't think about it a whole lot. I wasn't trying to um, minimalize the fact that, you know, I was going to have major invasive surgery on my birthday. I mean, I just, I, you know, Kim and I, we weren't worried about it, which is highly unusual. No, my, my mother couldn't understand why, why I wasn't freaking out and seeking second, third, and fourth opinions and all this stuff. But we were like, you know what? If I, if, if I get through it, God's got something for me. If I don't get through it, I'm going to heaven and it's going to be great. You know, we talked about it. You know, I just don't understand why I'm not worried about this. Because we put our trust in the Lord. And He took care of it. Now, the after effects, you know, those make me a little cranky. I'm sorry. But but through faith, though, that's my test. And, and I'm, I'm getting a little better every day with it. Praise God. But it has it has definitely significant significant it's it's grown my faith. Okay, that significant word it didn't want to come out right then. Um, but we can, sometimes we get tested with our growing faith. Now, God promises the Hebrews that if they obey his if they obey his decrees, he's not going to bring any of the diseases he brought on the Egyptians for either the Lord. I am the Lord who heals you. Basically, uh, then he gives a series of, uh, of health things. And it's about diet, sanitation, and all that. And that's in the book of Leviticus. When you look at that, if you look at that, it, basically if you can follow what Leviticus says, it'll keep you healthy. It's all about sanitation and health issues. Yeah. Our God is, is faithful enough to put in his word how to take care of ourselves. Isn't it amazing? Um, in the 14th century, there was an epidemic called the Black Death, and it was a, it was bubonic plague, and it killed more than a fourth of the population in Europe. They didn't know what to do to stop that disease from spreading, but if they only if they had only read the decree of God, the decrees that God gave Moses. They would have discovered the principles of the quarantine. They also would have discovered the principles of, of uh, the duty and the other part. By getting it out of town. Why do you think we have a sewer system? Where do you think that came from? They don't want to admit it. But God was the one who orchestrated it the whole time. Isn't that amazing? Look what Leviticus 13 says. Now the leper... <laughs> 
on whom the sore is, his clothes shall be torn and his head bare. He shall shave, he shall cover his mustache and cry unclean, unclean. He shall be unclean all the days he has the sore. He shall be unclean. He is unclean. He shall dwell alone. His dwellings shall be outside the camp. Now they didn't know. Now the Israelites in 1400 BC they didn't know anything about microbiology. They didn't know anything about germs or viruses or bacteria. Yet God God gave them the the uh, The wisdom of a quarantine. In other words, put people away. And by doing that, it keeps the spread of disease down. So now, they throw most those the, the stick or the log, whatever it was, into the water there at Mara, and the waters became sweet, and they could all drink. Now, think about how big this had to be to, to do two to four million people. We forget, when we, when we think of the word spring, we think of a little bit like a brook thing, right? I do. Two to four million people, plus animals and everything else. But they were all satisfied. Isn't that something? If God could take care of two to four million people, by throwing a piece of wood in the water, do you not have enough faith to think that he can take care of you? Now, it does not mean, and I hope I hope anybody who's listening to this does not think that I think your problem is minuscule and tiny. No, it's not. To you, it is very real, and it's very important, and it's very serious. Okay? However, Use your faith. Trust God. Watch what he's going to do. And it may happen immediately. It may take a couple years. It may not happen until you pass on and go to heaven. But either way, God's got it. And that should make us all say hallelujah and amen. Amen. All right. So they drink the water. And they head on. And then in Exodus 15, verse 27, it says, Then they came to Elam, where there were twelve springs of water and seventy palm trees. So they camped there by the waters. Something very significant there. How many tribes in Israel were there? How many people went into the Egypt to begin with? Wasn't it seventy? Wasn't it 70? Joseph's, well, Jacob's family? Jacob's family, the 12 tribes, and their, the, the heads of the 12 tribes, their wives and their kids, I believe it equaled 70. It, I, I could be wrong, because I'm trying to do this off the top of my head. Kim's going to check me. That's fine. Because I know she's not doing it for political gain or wokeness. <laughs> but don't you think that's significant? Every number, listen, folk, guys, every number, every name, every letter in God's Word is significant. And it all has meaning. All of it. They'll let you, now get this from, from Mara to Elam. They estimate it was about 20 miles. So the Lord supplied their need to get into the next 20 miles where he shows them this big oasis of 70 palm trees and 12 springs. So how do we go from our, our bitter Mara to our Elam? Well, just keep going. Don't give up. And if you feel like giving up, cry out to the Lord. Say, Lord, I feel like I'm, I feel like giving up. He already knows. He understands. And that is cool because He still loves us anyway. Hallelujah. Keep studying your Bible. Keep praying. Keep trusting. And God will lead us to, the, to our Elam. We're, 
We're going to have many morrows in our lives. We're going to have much bitterness in our life. That's just that's just human nature. That's just the way it is. However, nothing causes us to have intimacy with God like the morrows of life because He draws us closer through our disappointments. And then He increases our faith through our daily demands. So, they had that disappointment with the water. God took care of it. He takes them to he takes them to the the springs there at Elam and the palm trees, and God leaves God leaves them leaves the Israelites from that oasis to the desert of sin, which is between Elam and Sinai on the fifteenth day of the second month after they come out of Egypt. They're into it now about four weeks. Okay, we. When we read the scriptures, and I know you guys have heard, and I'm trying not to be boring over this, but when we read the scriptures, we just think it happened boom, 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 boom. No, if it had been, the Passover occurred on the 14th day of Nisan. All right, and then so they're 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 in the desert now four weeks. That's a while. So they get to the desert of sin. Interesting name, right? Uh -huh. And they, they start to complain because they don't have anything to eat. Now, if you're a mom and you see your baby's hungry, I get it. I get it. You know, you don't know what's going on. You're in the desert. When one, It's amazing. It is amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing how when one st person starts to complain... It just spreads like a disease. I remember I worked when I was working at the meat plant in Marshall. I rode with this guy named Dennis. <laughs> nice guy. With the most negative attitude I have ever seen in my life. At that particular moment. He was a big union guy. In Seattle, he worked for Boeing, and I don't know how he ended up in the little town of Bosworth, but he did. And because Bosworth, Missouri, population 125, huh. only one, really only two paved roads in our town. Three hundred something. Three hundred something. <laughs> yeah. Two paved roads. The rest gravel dirt. Half the houses were uh, abandoned. Uh, just a little bitty hole in the wall between Chillicothe and Marshall, Missouri, right in the middle, and Brookfield, Missouri. I used to say, you say, 66. how many? 66. 66, so pretty close to 70. Anyway. anyway. I used to say, I live in a town so small, it's 30 miles to Walmart in three different directions, which was absolutely true. Wow. And my mom says, my mom, I, I use my mom as an example. I mean, she lived in the country when she was growing up, and she's lived in Cape and other big cities. So she can't, you, you're driving all the way from Scott City, <laughs> Scott City to go to Cape shopping and all that. That's silly. I'm like, Mom, you don't seem to understand. We drove 30 miles in one direction, sometimes two or three times a day. That's nothing. And it's just, it's just not a big deal to us. But anyway. But anyway, Dennis, I mean, he just had an attitude. And you can ask my wife, a bad attitude or a good attitude spreads like wildfire. If you have a good attitude, it spreads. If you have a bad attitude, it also spreads. And so here they are, four <laughs> weeks in. They're in the desert of sin. All their provisions are running out. Now I get it, you know, for the men, they have livestock and they got kids. For the moms, they've got their kids, got some of their older relatives, and it's it's a stressful situation. Nothing though hurts our faith like short memories. The Israelites forgot. All the miracles that had taken place in the last four weeks. 
It's amazing. I mean, he freed, God freed them from slavery. He rescued them at the Red Sea. He took care of their water needs there at Mara. He took them to, he took them to uh, the, the oasis there at Elam. He promised that he was going to give them a land full of milk and honey. And they had totally forgotten where they were at. That quick. And we're not any different. But they, all of a sudden, they're like, man, that's it. We're, we're in the desert and we're going to die. What a, what a bummer. Now, I like what, I like what uh, verse 3 says. It says, Israel said to them, if we had only died by the hand of Adonai in the land of Egypt, where we sat by pots of meat and we ate bread until we were full. But you brought us into the wilderness to kill this entire congregation with hunger. They, you know, later on they complain, oh, man, I, I wish we were back in Egypt where we could eat the garlic and the leeks. Ooh. Ooh. I, I you know, I, I'm not... I, I like a, I like a few onions, but you know, uh, raw no. And garlic, a lot of garlic. Ew, they forget. I mean, but but I like what I like what Moses says here in in verse four of Exodus sixteen. He says, "Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not." Sometimes. To have our, our journey into intimacy with God, we got to be faithful in the little steps. That's why Jesus, you know, that's why Jesus tells us that we're to take up our cross and follow Him daily. Moses has enough. I mean, I mean, you know, I can just imagine a Moses saying, "Don't make me take this chariot and stop and take you outside." Right? Don't make me stop this car. I'll do it. Moses tells him, he says, you're not grumbling against us, but you're grumbling against the Lord. And, but it, what's really amazing is despite their lack of faith, God's going to bless them anyway. In the most supernatural way possible. And sometimes God will meet our needs and satisfy us even though we grumble against him. And yes, all God, you know, God is not afraid to stop the car and take us out to the woodshed. He's not afraid to do that. I mean, how, but when we lose faith, how can we know God has faith? Well, look at 2 Timothy 2.13. If we are faithless, He remains faithful. He cannot deny Himself. Even when we get mad at God, even when we grumble to God, even when we complain to God, He never stops loving us and will be faithful. But I wonder sometimes if we grumble too much, we don't get his very best. <clears throat> Sometimes if we, we just need to have faith that what God has for us is going to be his very best and it's going to be awesome. But we gotta we just gotta give it give in sometimes and just trust him. Do we not? Do we or do we not? Yeah. All right. <laughs> but look how uh even when we're guilty of sin, I love this one, God keeps His promise of forgiveness. Look with me at Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. This was after he murdered Bathsheba's husband and lost a child as a result. 
And he had enough wisdom to go to God and ask for forgiveness. Was King David's sin forgiven? Yes, he was. Yes, it was. Even when we, like David, are guilty of horrible sin, God loves us with his unfailing love and forgives us according to his great compassion. So now, what does God do? He provides an awesome miracle. And let me find it. I'm going to be in Exodus 16, verse 6. So Moses said, In the evening you will know that Adonai has brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you will see the glory of Adonai. For he heard your complaining against him. What are we? You complain against us. Then Moses said, Adonai will give you meat to eat in the evening and enough bread to fill you in the morning, since Adonai hears your complaints that you mutter against him. What are we? Your complaining is not against us, but Adon against Adonai. So Moses said to Aaron, Say to all the congregation of Israel, Come near before Adonai, because he has heard your complaint. Then as, um, as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of Israel, they looked towards the wilderness, and the glory of Adonai appeared in the cloud. Adonai spoke to Moses, saying, I have heard the complaining of Adonai Israel. Speak to them, at dusk you will eat meat, in the morning you will be filled with bread, that you will know that I am God. So when the evening fell, quails came and covered the camp. Moreover, in the morning there was a layer of dew all around the camp. All right, how many have ever had quail? They're little bitty things, aren't they? Very rich meat. Very good. A very okay. Very rich meat. Very good. Two to four million people. At, okay, so one quail will barely, will, will one quail fill a person up? Okay, all right. That's why I'm asking. I, I'm pretty sure I've had quail, but I'm not positive. I know they're a little bit, little bitty. But imagine, imagine four to eight million quail coming at one time. That's not a big e for God. <laughs> yeah, that's not a big e for God. So I mean, okay. Now remember. We were sitting out on our front porch this morning, and the geese are starting to fly south. And we heard, it was like one goose this morning. One goose. But, er, 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 we heard, no, this is a seal. Or, 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 okay. So we hear that, that, goose quite plainly now I don't know if a quail says hey or quack or whatever but I know that when a bird flies you can hear you can hear its wings flap against the air imagine what four to eight million quail sound like heading right towards you I would say it sounds like thunder don't you think or something similar and, and so um, they get their fill of quail. Two to four million people think of all the quail guts and the smell that goes with it. But imagine the awesome smell of two to four million quail being cooked at one time. I don't think they ate them all. <laughs> Imagine, imagine that. Now, did God deliver or not? The next morning, when they wake up, there's this stuff all over the ground. We know it as manna. It, it, it appears like thin flakes, like frost. It falls at dawn when the dew is forming and disappears as the sun is up. So the first thing they ask, So when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know. And the Moses said to them, This is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. They call it manna. Manna means what is it? Now we have a dog named Maddie. We had no idea what Maddie is. We know 
We know we know her mother was a beetle. And yeah, her daddy was just passing through. So when we were thinking about naming this dog, I said, why don't we name it Vanna? Because we don't know what it is. Okay? What it is. So we're going to name this dog Vanna. Vanna. Well, Miles says, this is my dog, and her name is Maddie. Now, this is the first time ever that Miles has taken a liking to a dog. What is it? It's Miles' dog <laughs> that we take care of. I thought that's interesting. Now, man, in, in, in Hebrew, it, it, it means what is it? I mean, okay, now this stuff is white. And it tastes like wafers made with honey. I mean, and it can be prepared by, you can grind it in a hand mill and make a bread on it and just throw it on a, on a hot rock or a stone or something or a pan and cook it that way. Um, you could boil it. You could make it into cakes. But God tells them to take an omer, which is about two quarts enough for one day. And Mo, God tells most to tell the people, do not keep of it, any of it till in the morning. Do they listen? No. Man. They just ate quail the night before. They get this, this beautiful stuff the next day. But, no, they're going to hoard it. And it begin, it, when they go to find it later, that later, it becomes filled with maggots and it starts to stink. I mean, we need to trust. It must be good, man. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> or maybe God's trying to prove a point. You know. But look, but, you know, we're to trust God daily to meet our needs. I mean, that Jesus even says so in Matthew chapter 6, verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. Yes. God doesn't want us to trust Him yearly, monthly, or weekly. He wants us to trust Him daily. So basically, um, the Israelites would gather what they needed for the day. And then the sun would just melt the rest away. That's kind of cool. But think about this. Now they ate manna for right around 38 years. We, we rounded off to 40 because later you're going to find out that they couldn't figure it out and they had to wander for 40 years. But God provided this stuff every day for 40 years. The scripture says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Am I right? What did also... What did Jesus say he was? Did he yeah, did he not say he was the bread of life? So even even in this manner for 40 years, God used the Holy Spirit used manna to show the Israelites and to show us that he is our daily bread. Isn't that cool? I've heard people who didn't like to take the word of God literally say, well, you know, that wasn't really a miracle. There was this stuff up on the mountains, the light that would blow off the trees and the rocks. They were just little flakes of that. I thought, first of all, ew, and, and that wouldn't taste sweet. And it's really a miracle then because it only blew six days every week. And on the seventh, it stopped for 40 years. That's a real miracle. I think it's going to say that. Let's look at that's that's awesome. Let's look at Exodus sixteen. Then he said to them, "This is what the Lord has said. This is most talking. Tomorrow is a Sabbath rest, a holy re a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake today, and boil what you will boil, and lay it for yourself while it remains to be kept until the morning. 
So that I am from morning as Moses commanded, and it did not stink, nor were there any worms in it. Then Moses said, eat, eat that today, for today is the Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather, but on the seventh day of the Sabbath there will be none. That was a great way to put that, Pastor Nancy. That was... But the Sabbath, now get this, how did they know that? The law had come into had had come in the stone yet, right? Well, they knew that all the way back from Adam and Eve. Didn't God rest on the seventh day? Did He need to rest? No. No. But He did it. He knew He did it. He did it for us. And so He's modeling. His word during this time. It goes back to what Paul said. These things have been written for our instruction. God's trying to show us that we need a Sabbath. We need to rest. I don't care how high energy you are. Eventually, you're not going to have any if you don't take the time to rest. Even on the Sabbath, they weren't to cook any food because he knows how easy it is for us as human beings to be distracted from worship. God has always wanted his people to carefully guard their day to worship him. And we'll see that in the Ten Commandments. Now, some people, some people are really sticky. They think that the Sabbath should be on Saturday, that we should be worshiping on Saturday. Some people say that because the Lord rose on the first day of the week, we should be worshiping Him on Sunday. And that's not an easy thing to try to figure out. In reality, we need to be worshiping Him every day. But setting one day a week, whatever day it is, I think is vitally important. Praise God, we have like Facebook and all that for those who can't make it. Kim, she, is just, she has worked her, been worked to the bone. It's just the way it is right now. There's a lot of things going on at work for her. And she and her boss are doing the absolute best they can, and they're both, they're both tired. Kim got the day off. So this morning, she took a Sabbath day and rested. But she still worshiped because, she, because of Facebook. She watched the service this morning out on the porch, and she was able to do a little ministry to our neighbor across the street all at the same time. It was, it was awesome, wasn't it? We need to take a rest. All of us do. So God tells Moses then to take it over a manna and keep it for generations to come so they can see the bread that I gave you to eat in the desert when I brought you out of Egypt. According to Hebrews 9 verse 4, here's where the pot is kept which had the golden censer of the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, where the golden pot that had the manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tablet of the covenants, the Ark of the Covenant. And I believe that the Ark of the Covenant is still around somewhere. And one day, we will be able to see that original pot of manna from all the way back in 14 or 1600 B.C. I just think that's kind of cool. Well, remember, as I told you, the, the Israelites ate that manna for 40 years till they reached the border of Canaan, Canaan. But why? Well, let's look why. God has a reason. Deuteronomy chapter 8, beginning in verse 2. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you and to know what was in your heart and whether you would keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with the manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, which Jesus quotes later on, by the way, but man shall live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of, of the Lord. How do we know that the word of the Lord is true? Well, for one thing, we trust Jesus Christ. And when Jesus quoted scripture... He quoted what we call the Old Testament because that's all they had at the time. And it's just as real today 
as it was way back then. And there are some believers, bless their pea-picking hearts, uh -huh. that say, well, I'm a New Testament Christian and the Old Testament doesn't matter. Well, I got news for all of us. The Old Testament is Jesus concealed. The New Testament is Jesus revealed. As my favorite teacher, Chuck Missler, says, 40, 40 different authors over a thousand year or so period wrote the, wrote the scriptures. Many of them didn't know each other, but yet it's the, the Word of God all focuses on one person, Jesus. Forty authors over a thousand year period with one focus, Jesus Christ. Think about that. Every day there are commands that we need to obey if we're going to have an end of a journey. The most difficult ones are those that tell us how God wants us to treat people. Matthew 7 verse 12, Jesus sums up all the commands in regard to how we're going to treat people. Therefore, whatever you want me to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law of the prophets. How many get along with everybody? He's a leader. <laughs> well, all right, there you go. There's the challenge. There's the challenge. I mean, we, you know, it's it is easy to get along with people. Sometimes the best thing to do is just shake your head and agree and turn around and walk away. Try not to get in an argument with them because the scripture says, um, and I don't know where I don't know the address of this. And I know this is a big paraphrase, but don't argue with a fool because you'll end up like him. I think that's for Proverbs. I think I, I, I think that's pretty wise counsel, right? Um, Jesus told the disciples they were having a discussion with some, uh, I think it was Pharisees. It might have been just people on the street. And Jesus kind of goes, why are you arguing with them? Yeah, don't. <laughs> yeah. You know, the, the, the old saying, it's, uh, it's easier to catch a fly with honey than vinegar, right? Same thing. But, the more we get to learn and trust God and the more we obey Him, <laughs> the more our faith will grow because we will experience God do some amazing things in our life. Sometimes it is good for us as, as human beings to talk about what God's done. Now, the problem is, with that. Sometimes all we end up is talking about what God did in the past and we're not looking forward to what God's going to do for us in the future. It's good for us to remember what God for done, God has done for us in the past and Kim and I will always say to each other, well, we know God took care of us before, he'll take care of us again. Yes. And I tell you what, that is, that is showing your faith. God will take care of you. You've got to trust him. And don't be afraid. Even if you're challenged spiritually, emotionally, whatever, trust God. Because by doing that, you'll experience his peace, his power, and his presence in a supernatural way that not only blesses us, but makes our life exciting and joyful. God increases our faith through disappointments and daily demands. He does. So as we leave tonight, think about what God's done for you. And then say this, if God took care of me before, he'll take care of me again. And however he does it, just don't be disappointed, but praise him. And watch what he'll do. It's just an amazing thing. Amen? Amen? All right, Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this study tonight. Watch over us and take care of us. And just thank you so much uh, for helping us through our times where we need in our faith, Lord. We have faith that you're going to take care of us in the good times. We have faith that you're going to take care of us in the bad times. We thank you, Jesus, because you are mighty and awesome and powerful. And I thank you, Jesus. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
All right, we'll have a lesson again next week, and then the week after that, Kirk Devaney's going to be here. So I mean, I, he, he's going to have both morning and evening services. Uh, so just so just trust, and let's see what God's going to do with Brother Kirk. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you so much. Thank you. I love all these Moses stories. I'm curious if you guys have ever heard an old Keith Green album that had the uh, song, So You Want to Go Back to Egypt. You guys have talked about it. I have not heard it. Sometimes we oh, play for about three minutes. It's kind of hilarious.